Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lord, now as we try and recall to mind what it is we actually need to be thankful for. I ask, Lord, in this time of teaching, reflection, that we, each of us, we will be able to pinpoint that to which we need to be thankful for. Through your Son, Jesus, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Well... First and foremost, um, uh, just for the sake of recording and for those that may be watching this on the internet later, uh, you need to know something that happened this morning. We finished uh, early, the worship time, because I might make reference to it during this talk. You also need to know there was a point of welcoming each other and hugging each other and saying hello. I was actually not welcomed by anybody. And then Andy Robertson, followed by some others, decided to come and welcome him. As he ran up, he fell flat on his face on the stage. It was very funny. Reason for that is because actually it might well fit in nicely to the sermon this morning. So you just need to know that. It's not to embarrass Andy Robertson, though that is funny. Um, but it is, to, it is uh, a point in taking. Pride is a marvellous thing, isn't it? So, it's Christmas! Yay! And then Boxing Day, we'll be going, right, here we go again. Another 365 days to go. Yeah, I know it's a leap year in 2016. Oh, what a journey it is for Christmas, isn't it? We sit there, we suddenly fall into December. We're like, oh, presents. Oh, what are we going to do Christmas Day? Who are we going to invite? Who yeah, who have I forgot for the cards? And suddenly that card appears on the doorstep and you think, Oh, I forgot them. Quickly write one back. Honestly, we really did remember you. Um, um, I like to say I have any involvement in any of ours. I don't. I write my family ones. That's as far as it goes. Uh, Joy, I'm glad to say, does the rest. But, you know, it's... We sort of come in, oh, yes, it's Christmas, and the music's on. Well, the music's probably on in about August time, it feels like, these days in the shops. Um, but, uh, you know, and we walk into this whole Christmas, and there's meant to be Advent. And, you know, we as a, a church, we don't sort of do the Advent-type stuff every Sunday. Uh, you know, some other denominations do it really, really well. We, we're not... Um, and part of that, you know... I, I don't even, I've got to say, it doesn't cross my mind too much because I was never brought up in church. It's not sort of instilled in me, if that makes sense. But, um, well, it's like a journey. And I was thinking about this uh, brief, very briefly, for nothing to do with Christmas. Went shopping very briefly yesterday afternoon. Walking around the shops, and it was really quiet. A trick for you, if you want to go somewhere where it's really quiet, go to Hamwell. All right, if you don't want the Christmas rush on the last Saturday before Christmas, go there. Apparently, it's, really, it's great. And um, the music was on. I was sitting there thinking, we're walking around, and you can hear the announcements on our tannoy. Oh, it's Christmas. And you hear it on the radio, and you think, yes. And then come the 26th of December, that'll be it. And normally, actually, there's quite a come down for people emotionally on the 26th of December, stroke the 27th, because the anticipational thrill for Christmas Day ends. And then all of a sudden, there's like an emotional fadumph. And actually, for quite a number of people, that is quite traumatic. Because you're so hopeful for this great day on the 25th, for the friends or the family you're going to see, for the food that you're going to eat, for maybe the presents you might receive, and hopefully you want to look forward to the anticipational smile on the presents to those, uh, to those people who you give presents to. And then when it's all over, for dumpf. 
And then we start thinking about the credit card bill afterwards. Then we start thinking about how we're going to pay that off. <coughs> mm, there's a little... Um, mm -hmm. It's Christmas! Isn't that cheerful? Some of us wear wonderful Christmas jumpers. I think there's some school somewhere that's broken the Guinness Book of Records this year for having every pupil and teacher turn up with uh, all the Christmas jumpers on. I saw nothing on the Christmas jumper relating to Jesus. That's just me being slightly miserable, just for a moment. But I'm wondering, this journey we have into Christmas Day, do you really reflect and take it out into the bigger life span of yourself? So we're going to look at a journey that happened that we look at every year, or we know about every year, or it's displayed on our Christmas cards every year. I would always say it's always displayed incorrectly, but we won't worry about that too much. And the reason I've not bothered to put the laptop on to display the words is, again, I don't want my usual act of that it's no longer working, so I just slam the thing down. But two, I'm only going to read it once and probably hardly refer back to it. It's Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 16. <clears throat> As you can tell, I still haven't got my throat fully restored from my cold last week. Uh, Sunday last week, I was not good, and it was even funny when I was talking at one of the local primary schools, and I was trying to do uh, funny voices for the different journeys of the various characters, and uh, Mary was a bit like something out of, uh, if you've ever seen Monty Python, The Life of Brian, I sounded like the mum. He's a very naughty boy! Uh, it didn't come out very at all well. Um, but anyway, the kids apparently loved it because I had parents coming up to me all week saying, my kids just came home thinking that was brilliant. I was putting on different hats. But my throat is still not 100%, I think, due to that. Matthew 2, uh, 1 to 16. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking... Where is the new bald king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem, in Judea, they said. For this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah. For a ruler will come from you who will be a shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way. And the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. He went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother. Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. Have you ever considered that story and how it applies to you today. It was interesting, I was, knew that uh, I felt God wanted me to talk about this particular story this morning as part of the, the it's Christmas um, rush and on this particular day. And I sat there really questioning, God, do you really want me to talk about this journey? Do you really want me to talk about this? 
And I sat there and it was all about Tuesday sometime and I was here and I said, to, you know, I just want to clarify, make sure, give me some sort of sign, Lord. And I was actually, actually here. Give me a sign, Lord. And as I turned around, there was a star. And I thought, oh, yeah. I hadn't even related this with what God was saying. Sometimes that does happen uh, to teachers. They do sit there sometimes wondering, have I got this right for this week? Well, let's look at these, uh, these, these three or these men. These men who come from the east. Firstly, we don't know the number of them. We know they brought three gifts, gold, frankincense and myrrh. And it was from the 6th century AD that they were called Gaspar, and I cannot pronounce these. Anybody knows the, quar- the carol, could you tell me? Caspar, Melchior. Melchior, thank you. And Balthazar. 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 I've got them written down here, I just can't pronounce them. Thanks, Joy. And of course, it was immortalised in that great Christmas carol, We Three Kings, which we'll be singing tonight. But actually, we don't know how many there were. We know they weren't kings. Most of our, I say this every year, most of our Christmas carols, you can take them and just go, no, wrong. <laughs> it's like that one, no crying he makes. Yes, he did. Jesus bawled his eyeballs out when he was a baby. No crying, please. Mary must have sat again, give me a break. She was a normal mother like every other mother. And very young, you're right, maybe no more than 12 or 13. Different culture, different time. But in the Greek here, the word for them is magi, which can have various meanings. Wise men, royal astrologers, astronomers, magicians. But when you pin it down, I'm not going to go to the ins and outs of it, but when you pin it down, they were probably priests and astronomers all rolled into one. Now, please note this. They were astronomers, and I will come back to that in a moment. They clearly had some wealth because of the prezes they gave. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh weren't exactly cheap. So they probably were the royal priests and astronomers. And this is the key thing, they weren't Jewish. They were not part of the Jewish religion or the Jewish Messiah expectation. They were not expecting a Jewish Messiah. They weren't Jewish, they were Gentiles, they were completely outside. They had their own religions. Just note that. They were definitely stargazers, readers of the stars, looking for signs in the stars. Not looking for a saving Messiah, but the stars to tell them something. Now, let's make this clear. This is not star signs. This is not your quick flip to about page 23 in the newspaper, about four pages beyond the centre page. Oh, what does my sign for me today say today? That is not that. Totally different. They wanted signs from the stars. Why? Well, by the time they were around, stars become the big thing. Stars will tell you about great men coming to earth. That was the sort of fashion for its day. Do you know how that came about? 44 BC. The Roman Emperor Julius Caesar, at the time of his funeral, when his funeral pyre, his lit fire, was in full blaze... A coincidence moment occurred when the white dwarf dying star went nova. Uh, if you want to know, a white dwarf, it has a moment, at the, if you don't know, at the very moment when it's expounding its last sort of peak of energy, like when you're about 18 and that's about the peak of your energy left and after that all your energy starts going as you get older, yeah? <laughs> right? It's that sort of thing, this peak of energy. And it, it whoa, flash. And then it becomes then a dying star afterwards. Well, that happened as Julius Caesar 
His body was being cremated. Well, you can imagine what happened. They all decided at this point that Julius Caesar had joined the pantheon of their gods. He entered into the God realm and become God. And that's why then subsequently from that moment on, any Caesar was seen as divine. You start to see some connections when you read the New Testament, some of the arguments they have to have. And uh, you can see that connection. So basically, seeing star signs telling you about great men and great currencies had become the thing. So these guys were stargazers. Now, I don't want us just to sit there and think they were just some sort of, on their knees, super spiritual lot, just going, and we're waiting for a sign. They were actually incredibly intelligent people. And actually, they allowed science and sort of myth, sort of faith, to happily blend and coexist in their study of the stars. We know in today, we're trying to separate science and faith that seems to be an always an ongoing thing, and I think that's just absolutely ridiculous. All science seems to be doing is proving our faith every turn. But anyway, so they didn't. They quite happy to allow certain things to blend. Doesn't mean they had it accurate, doesn't mean they had it spot on. I'm not one of us all turning into stargazers. Watching Star Wars is okay. I've not seen it yet. I do not want to know. And I'm not going to be able to see it until after Christmas. Yes, I'm gutted. Anybody knows me? I, uh, oh, anyway, moving on. So the question is, what did these magi see that time that made them get up and want to go? Does anybody know? Anybody got a clue? Anybody got a clue... Yeah, oh, actually, I might end up arguing with you. This would be good. Nobody knows. Say again. Nobody knows. True. Ultimately, we don't know. But there are some theories. And I like one of them, Kevin. So we're going to stick with that one. <laughs> We've had some good debates in the past. So, well... The first one might have been they saw Halley's Comet in 11 BC. That's a little bit too early. And this is the one I like. I used to thought it was the dog star, but actually I've changed my opinion since then. I think it's more this one. There was, in 7 BC, a conjunction of the two planets, Jupiter and Saturn. So they sort of in their orbit, came round together, and then there's this sort of, they obviously are bright when they're somehow the two planets, come. don't understand me, I'm not, I love stars, I love planets, but I don't understand the science behind it. When they come together, they create a brilliance, yeah? A sort of a light that is quite brilliant. And this happened in 7 BC, ready for this, and it happened three times that year. So this is science recording this, it happened on the 29th of May, the 3rd of October, and the 4th of December. So just bear that in your thinking. It's happened before, not three times in a year like, quite like that, and it's happened since. Actually, the last time it happened was in the year 2000. But it was so quick and over and done with, and it wasn't quite in the right place where we're at, it, it just sort of flashed past. But this is the difference here. This time it happened in the area of the sky known as Pisces, not star signs. Pisces, that particular area of the sky that they defined as Pisces, was believed to mark the end of the sun's old course and the beginning of the new. Jupiter was seen as the royal planet, and Saturn had long been held as the symbol of Israel. So, a well-versed 
astronomer would have read this and thought what? So the first time that conjunction happens, he sees the two planets, Jupiter, which represents royalty, and Saturn, which represents Israel or the Western lands. What do you think he would have thought? Where? I can't. Oh, sorry. I haven't been blessed with an eye back here. Do apologize about that, Hannah. That something special is happening in Israel or among the Jews. Yep, something special has happened in Israel. Anybody else? Okay. Be so easy. I was waiting for somebody to say, ah, oh, the Messiah has been born. And glad to say you've picked up on the fact that I said they had no expectation of that. Because it happening in Pisces, which was unusual, this clearly said to them that a significant new age has begun. And they also saw that sovereignty and power has transferred to Israel. That would have been some of the deductions that they would have made. But you didn't know any of that, did you? You just thought they saw some star and just followed it. I loved all of that, sorry. I don't apologise. That, that appeals to my uh, sense of sci-fi, my sense of... That now makes sense. To me, there's something about that that makes sense. Of these men, and we're assuming they're all men, but they probably were, men actually uh, looking at something and going, whoa, that means something. Yeah? You ever thought that through? Okay. So they then decide to go on a journey. 1,050 miles worth. We probably assume they're from Persia, uh, Monday Iran, and they need to make, and apparently it's 1,050 miles. I'm not very good at geography. I've had to look this up, no end. So if I get this wrong, somebody say something, politely. Now, 1,050 miles, if you're driving by car these days, is really one day's worth of travel. You can drive from the top of John O'Groats down to the bottom of Land's End, which is 880 miles, I've driven it. You can do that easily in a day. You're not exactly awakened with it. But, you know, you can do it easily within a day. And I'm talking within the day. So early in the morning to sort of mid-late night. Not, not a 24-hour stretch, much shorter than that. If you had a car. Unfortunately, for some reason, cars weren't invented then. So they would have had to load up their camels or whatever uh, they used and travelled. And it could have well taken them something like five to six months. It would not have been an easy journey. It would have been dangerous, had many perils. Plus, they were also going into a foreign land. That was fraught with everything. So I just want you just to imagine just for a minute, okay? You're the stargazers. <laughs> I know it was quiet this morning, but please. I'm not going to do some deep biblical teaching here this morning. I, I, this is about us reflecting on something. So, you're the stargazers. Yeah. Hey! You've seen a moment happen in the sky. Oh, that's happened in Pisces. No, put away the mail paper. That's happened in Pisces. Oh, that means something new. Sovereignty and, and, and power's been transferred. We need to go. So you get your camel, Fred, John and... Joe, out of their stable, you load them up, you load up supplies for yourself, you s then go, by the way, got to take some gifts as well, gold, frankincense and myrrh, you sell it all up, and you go with your colleagues. You decide to go on effectively a five-month journey to a foreign land Knowing full well, it's not going to be the easiest of journeys in the world. P 
purely because you've seen something happen in the sky and you've read that as something significant has just taken place in the land of Israel. It will relate to a man. You will assume it's some sort of king has been born or taken place. But what you know is power and sovereignty is transferred. That's how you've read that. You know no more than that. That's it. And a lot of that is really guesswork. You actually don't know the journey. You don't know really ultimately why you're going. Why would you make that journey? It's a real question. Why would you make that journey? That's all you know. Out of curiosity. Curiosity, okay. I've got to say, that is curiosity that is, as the phrase goes, curiosity killed the cat. It could have killed them because of the journey. Dennis. Is it because it was written beforehand on what they were supposed to do by God? I come back to the fact that they weren't Jewish. So they more than likely wouldn't have read the scriptures. So they wouldn't, they, I hear what you're saying, it's so easy to fall into that trap. I think that's why we don't sometimes study that story well enough. Um, we've got to remember, they weren't Jewish uh, people. They weren't part of that. But yeah, good, good, good idea. If there were priests and astronomers and they were from a different nation, they would want to align kingdoms, trade routes, honor, develop kind of allegiances to this new um, power source that would probably for them be a counterbalance to the Roman Empire. Thank you. Yep. It was more about selfish reasons they wanted to go. Keep the peace. Well, if the theory of them seeing this conjunction of planets three times happened. It's not theory, I decided it's real. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> choose to disagree with you. Okay. Um, <laughs> if that happened, then they would have taken it, I would have thought they'd have taken it quite seriously. If it's happened three times. No, no, it only happened the first time for them. Oh, okay. I'm just telling you what's happened three times. So I would have said if it's three times, you know, like God underlines things for us. Ah, oh, very good point. But I will come back to that in a moment. Okay, thank you. If they were the, the scientists of the time, scientists have a tendency to be quite obsessional about things, and so they would be absolutely determined to find out what it was. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Excuse me, can I just squeeze through? Thank you. There's something excited in there, and then they would like to know what it is. Something exciting, so and they want to know what, what it is. It is. Yes. Yep, thank you. Sorry, was it somebody else? I'm getting... Who's that? Where? Ah, oh, charity. They were learned men and probably studied and very certain that um, there's going to be a big event and they wanted to be the one to find out what it is. Okay, thank you. Big event, yes. I need to make sure I walk like this in front of the speaker. Big event, yes. But we look at this event now through our eyes and we know what it meant, don't we? They didn't. But they had some sort of hope. There was something about it that made them think, this is enough that we need to make the journey. Michael been right, selfish reasons, aligned powers, you know, Make up friends, and you, you're going to fight with me, aren't you? Yeah, 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 against the Romans, yeah? You laugh, but that's what they did. But I think they, because of the way it came out of Pisces, because of all that, I think they knew this was a significant king that had been born. And we see this now because, what do they do? They, tra they travel to Jerusalem. Now, that's logical, isn't it? You're going to the seat of power, the capital of 
Israel. Because I've been saying for years, they weren't very wise men, were they? Because they went to the current king and said, where's the new king? (laughs) Especially when King Herod had a fairly decent reputation for not being a very nice piece of work. But we'll go to him and go, where's the new king? Not very wise, we would normally say, but actually logical. Why? Well, if you're going to see a new king who's been born, you're going to assume... It's happened in the line of the pre-current king. So they were probably turning up and going, Hi, King Herod, where's your son? Do you see the point? I can make logic of this. And so then you can imagine their looks on their faces when they get King Herod going, Who? Who? And all of Jerusalem were greatly disturbed. That Not probably the whole of Jerusalem were greatly disturbed. That would have been interesting. It was more than likely those who were in power within Jerusalem. Those who were um, uh, uh, King Herod's cohorts. But I want to note the question. That all of Jerusalem were concerned. The Jewish... The Jews were waiting for a Messiah. They had an expectation. And in Micah chapter 5 verse 2, which I didn't mark out for myself. That's really clever. In Micah chapter 5 verse 2, we'll get there in a minute, bear with me. There it is. It's after Obadiah. After Jonah. It's there. I do know where it is, it's just it's another one of them moments. But you, O Bethlehem, are only a small village among all the people of Judah, yet a ruler of Israel will come from you, one whose origins are from the distant past. And then in Numbers 24, 17... I see him, but not here and now. I perceive him, but far in the distant future. A star will rise from Jacob. A scepter will emerge from Israel. And then it goes on. That was their Messiah expectation, that a star would be a sign. So it makes us laugh, doesn't it, really, when these these wise men, these magi, these royal astronomers turn up and say, we've seen a star in the sky, where's your new king? And a rather Jerusalem going, yes, the Messiah's arrived. They panic. Herod calls the religious uh, priests and leaders and says, where is this meant to happen? They say, in Bethlehem. And this is great. And then they then quote from the Old Testament as we class it now. And instead of then going, wow, that was a public report, these magi, in the centre court of King Herod. Now we know that they've seen this star. They reckon, therefore, then there's this king. It's in Bethlehem. Let's go check this out and actually see if our Messiah has arrived. No. What happens? Herod goes, private meeting. Hi, lads. Um, You don't know this, but actually I want to kill him because I like my power. I don't care is what we've been expecting. I want him to die. So if you could, you don't know that, it's in the back of my thoughts. Actually, what I really want to do is worship him. My whole heart is for him. So could you go and make a, a place and find him for me? And please come back, because I want to humble myself. King Herod, by the way, is a nasty piece of work. I want to humble myself before him and worship him. Could you imagine that? Notice it was a private meeting. If I was the wise men, I'd be going, hang on a minute, why was that a private meeting? Still took God to tell them, don't go that way, go another way. But they were probably caught in a really bad moment at that moment, because they, the wise men, like, we was expecting to find the new king here. Ah! Wonder if they were scared. 
They've been travelling for five months or, you know? Hard journey. Think they've arrived. Oh, here's our experience. Long last, we've arrived. We're going to find this king. The hope and the exhilaration that must have been in them to discover no king here. Oh, it's Christmas. We're coming up for Christmas Day. Yes, the 25th is going to be amazing. Oh, it's going to be the best day ever. 26th, oh well. Do you get the point? Herod, just to let you know why he reacted so badly, other than the fact he wanted power, was half Jewish, half Idumean. He was not fully Jewish. He was appointed by the Roman Senate in 40 BC and took control of the country by 37 BC. You ready for this? He dies in 4 BC. Jesus was clearly born prior to him dying. And if these two planets were aligned in 7 BC, I would say the logic is that Jesus' birth was 7 BC. So this new year we'll be shouting, Happy 2023! You need to know something about our calendar. A monk, Dionysus the Small, in 6 AD, a lot happened in 6 AD that's not been very helpful. In 6 AD, did not have accurate information on Herod's death. So the switch from the Roman to the Christian calendar is actually based upon his faulty calculations. We are probably about seven years out. So if you read commentaries and stuff these days, there's always, it could have happened here, or it could have happened, you know, and there's always sort of a, a two-bit gap. It doesn't change the fact that Jesus was born. It doesn't change the fact he died on the cross. It just means we got our dates wrong. Do you know, it wasn't at winter time he was born. You all know that, don't you? I don't need to tell you that, surely. But then that would make sense for me of the conjunction. The three planets, they see it on the first outing, Takes them five months to get there. They see it again on the second outing. They're still going for it. And then they see it on the third outing. That is when they arrive, when they see the star and they are filled with joy in Bethlehem. I want to reread 9 and 11 to you again. After this interview, the wise men went to their way and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house, saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Their whole journey from beginning to end, is based on hope. Everything about their journey is about hopeful. Not wishful thinking, but hopefulness. You don't make that sort of journey unless you're hopeful for something. And especially for them in the significance of the Pisces and all this sort of stuff, for them in their heads, they've gone, wow, there's something really amazing has happened. We need to go and find out about it. where the star has stopped they're filled with joy it's like at long last yes we found it we found this king where this sovereignty and power has arrived they walk in could you imagine yes going in oh we're going to see this king it's a baby not in a stable by the way you know Jesus was born back here it took them about five to six months so Jesus wasn't in the manger anymore Sorry to blow your brains out about that. Again, the Christmas carols are wrong. You're not going to turn up tonight because you don't want to sing them. It's all right. We'll sing all those other great classics. 
by Slade, Mariah Carey. <laughs> All I want for Christmas is you. Anyway. Can you imagine singing that song and meaning it as a worship song to Jesus? Sorry, just let's have a sideline track for a moment. Imagine singing that the next time you hear it for the umpteenth time this year. Singing it to Jesus. All I want for Christmas is you, Lord. I don't want the presents. I don't want anything else. I just want you, Lord. All these magi wanted was to see this king, this significant man who the stars had told them has arrived. And not only do they just want to see this king, they actually go, and his gold, his frankincense, and his myrrh. Here's your prezzies. All neatly wrapped with a little bone, a little tag says, to Jesus, Merry Christmas, love the Magi. <laughs> According to their understanding... Note this, again, they weren't Jewish. They weren't expecting a Messiah. They weren't expecting anything else. And it was according to their religious, scientific, myth-based legends that they went to go and find this Messiah. It was based upon their understanding. There was Not Messiah, this king. It was based on their understanding. They went to and worship this king. Not on careful studies of the Old Testament scriptures. Not on their careful history of them knowing about Moses and King David and the prophets and Isaiah. It was based on their understanding from their culture. That they saw this hope and they wanted it. They didn't understand the full significance of the baby, child, whatever, who they were bowing down to. Who wants a little bet that went up and bowed down and they went, coochie, coochie, coo, and he burst into tears. <laughs> I'm trying to point out some very humanity here. We sit there and go, oh, look at them so holy and giving their gifts. And they, they didn't have a clue. All they knew was some king would be born in some... And the worst thing was that they went to the capital to think there is the king. No, he's not. He's in some pokey little backwater town called Bethlehem. Hmm, why is he here? And actually, I will tell you now, it will be 33 years later until the outcome of this baby's life would be recognised. They probably never got to see or hear the final moments of Jesus. I wonder if they ever got to hear about the experiences of, of God's kingdom reigning in, this person who's casting out demons, this person who's healing, this person who seems to be preaching a great gospel of love and who is taking down the current um, religious law. I doubt they did, because they returned back home. They might have died before Jesus started his ministry. They could have died on the way back. Yet, there was an expectant hope for them when they arrived and they latched onto it. They saw a history-changing moment and went, bam, let's go. A history-changing moment. Let's go on this arduous journey. Let's go on this long, unknown, time-consuming journey and get that hope confirmed. Just a minute. You are the Magi. You don't know how long it's really going to take you. It's time-consuming. For five months or so, it took up their entire life. They didn't do anything else along the way. They didn't have a quick holiday. It wasn't the easiest of journeys. I'm sure there were plenty of obstacles. I'm sure there were wild animals that went for them. I'm sure they had to deal with muggers. Imagine how well they had to hide that gold, that frankincense and that myrrh. I don't know, they might have taken a little army with them. 
for protection. We really don't know. But they went on this long journey. It was a pilgrimage. What about us? What about you today on your journey with Jesus? We're on this great journey of life, aren't we? It's Christmas! Ah, you see, you're not having such a reaction to it now, are you? It just marks another year. We're on this journey of life and it's got perils, it's got dangers, it's got stresses, has it not? Does not make life easy at all. Trust me, I am not standing here as someone who's having a nice sailing life at the moment, you know. I've not gone through life sailing it through. I, like everybody else, has gone through perils, dangers and stresses. And we all go through it. And we're going to go through it like those magi. Go on that travelling journey, that preparation of, right, there's this, this Lord called Jesus who's promised me something. And I'm going to go on the journey with him. I'm going to pack up my camel and I'm going to go on a life journey with him. I'm going to go through the dangers. I'm going to go through the perils. I'm going to go through the stresses and go through the heartache and the pain that can come with it. And then you say to yourself, maybe when you're going through troubles and strife, you go, what's at the end of this journey? So that's a real question. While my throat is drying up, what is at the end of this life journey? You might well stumble and fall, running up to the stage. Whip! Sorry, couldn't resist. But what's at the end of this life journey? Some of us think it might be a reward, but a reward comes in different shape. It might not be what you expect, but it is a reward. A reward, okay. What's at the end of this life journey? Knowledge and fulfilment of prophecy. So at the end of your life journey, it's knowledge of the fulfilment of the prophecy? I'm just clarifying that, yeah? Yes, guys. No, we be coming, we coming to the earth, we go away. I thought you were talking about the, the journey of the, the three wise men. Oh, sorry. No, I'm talking about us now. I do apologise, it's my fault. Let me clarify, I'm talking about us. What is the end of the knowledge for you today, Mark, at the end of your life journey? The fulfilment that I will go back to the Father, that God will have me. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, Jesus has promised to us that life, life in an abundance. Jesus has promised us life in abundance. The King of the Jews. Amen. That all the scriptures have been... Excuse me. All the scriptures have been fulfilled. That he has redeemed us from the earth. His bride. Okay. I'm going to push slightly the way I did with Mark, just ever so slightly. What about you, Dennis? Because you've said we. What about you, Dennis? I've been, I've been saved um, and brought back to Christ. Amen. Anybody else? Something really digging out here. So from what I can tell, you've all said there's hope. Am I right? Sorry, is it 10 o'clock this morning again that we're all quiet? I can tell that from what you've said, there's hope. So you are the Magi travelling on your journey your life journey with hope that when you reach Boxing Day, there is still more yet to come. Yes. Am I right? Yes. That's obviously an analogy. That actually, Christmas Day, midnight, as in 
11.59, when it trips into Boxing Day, it is not all over. You haven't lost your hope, have you? There is hope beyond. And what do you base that hope on? That question was not in my notes. What do you base that hope on? <laughs> Hannah obviously wants to be first at every answer today. I hope I'm first at the gates as well of heaven. <laughs> she wants to be first at the gates of heaven. Well, Jesus said that's not for him to decide, but his father in heaven. <laughs> but that's not my answer. I'm quite happy to take the back of the queue. No, no, no. <laughs> The hope is based on Jesus Christ being the, the hope of glory that we have, I have in him. Excellent. Amen. Good answer. Anybody else? What is that hope? Based on his promises. Based on his promises, which you, re, you know from where? From his word. The Bible and? And uh, him Sorry, living in me. Sorry, I'm pushing you like I did. That's all right, yeah. And him living in me. And him living in you. Hey, Jim, the deposit of the Holy Spirit in you that guarantees your future hope. Amen. And the witnesses. The Bible has got witnesses. And for 2,000 years, there are Christian witnesses who say the love of Christ is in them. And that hope is in them. We are not the Magi. We are not ending up seeing some child at the end of our journey and his mother, are we? We're seeing the God, Lord, Saviour, Lover, Sacrifice, the God with eternal life, the God with the power of life and death, the Lord, the Warrior. When you go at the end of this, that is who you are seeing. That is who you are meeting. He who has said, come on in, my child, I love you. Come and have it all now. Have the lot. And we've got a Bible that tells us. We've got the deposit of the Holy Spirit that tells us. Those magi just had a conjunction of two planets. So why on Boxing Day do we sometimes get that <clears throat> What should be driving our life is that hope. The problem is so many of us don't believe sometimes that hope because we say, no, that's not me, that's for the person next to me. Hence why I push Dennis slightly. And him turning it on himself a bit. Not that I think Dennis doesn't have that hope in his heart. I just, just wanted you to make it a bit more personal. So on this life journey today for the next six, no, five days now until Christmas. Which, by the way, has been for the last 2,000 years. And maybe a few extra years because it might be 2023 next, in a couple of weeks' time. It has been like this, this hope that we have as believers in Christ, that we live in that hope. If you have committed your life to Jesus Christ and you have that deposit of the Holy Spirit in you, then you have that hope. And what you see today and before you, you should live in the hopeful expectation. That hope should actually register and infect and influence your life journey today. Not what you see around you, not what's before your face. That cross, not the star. That cross and what Jesus said about that and what then happened after the resurrection should give you that hope that you should be journeying. The Magi had none of that. And yet they went on the journey. And notice I say this again, they weren't Jewish, they weren't expecting a Messiah, so they weren't effectively right with God, in inverted commas. 
There's no such thing as being right with God to go on the journey. You just go on the journey. You just get on your camel or you get baptised, if you know what I mean, and you just go on the journey. So just for a second, ask yourself the question, what drives my life today? Is it real hope? Do I sacrifice myself for others? Is my attitude and my actions based on the hope that I have in Jesus Christ? Is the way I treat other people the same love that Jesus Christ has shown me? Or am I out to get what I need and want? out of this life. I want all the prezzies on the 25th. And when I've opened them all, and it gets to the 26th, I go, well, they were a five-minute wonder then, weren't they? Where's the next lot? What is it that drives your hope this year and into 2016? Better stick to the official Christian calendar. Is it the hope of Jesus Christ in your life? Or is it some vague hope that next year will be different for some bizarre reason and Jesus is out of the picture? <coughs> to take you a moment just to sit with that. Just reflect with God just for a minute. I'm going to read Romans 5. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. And we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. For we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us. Because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. Lord, I want to pray for all of us that are on this journey of life with you. Lord, I want to pray that we, at this Christmas time, for all of us, have hope. Hope in our hearts. It drives our waking thoughts. Hope of knowing that one day we will see you again in glory. That we will be in glory. Lord, I pray that that drives our, our relationships. drives our understanding of whatever trials and stresses we're going through today. Lord, that we see all of them in the light of the hope that you have given us. In the name of Jesus, amen. We 
do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.